for those of you who don't know him. So Bill Plotkin, PhD, is an eco-depth psychologist, wilderness guide, and agent of cultural evolution. As the founder of Animus Valley Institute, he has, since 1980, guided thousands of women and men through nature-based initiatory passages, including a contemporary Western adaptation of the pan-cultural vision fast. He's also been a research psychologist studying non-ordinary states of consciousness, professor of psychology, rock musician, and a whitewater river guide. Bill is the author of several books, including his most recent book titled The Journey of Soul Initiation, which will be the topic that we're going to be exploring today. So thank you, Bill, for being with us. And I'm going to go ahead and let you take it away and tell us a little bit about your new work and the book that you just wrote. Thanks, Andrea. A great pleasure to be here. Big fan of IONS. I miss being there. It's been a few years. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be speaking to people who are attracted to IONS. So I want to start with setting a context, and it's simply the context that all of us in the world are experiencing now. Um, this is a um, very challenging time, of course. Um, multiple crises on every dimension. Um, everybody knows what I'm referring to. And um, so a lot of us are, are feeling very vulnerable at this time. And a lot of us are feeling very engaged. And that's actually maybe a great combination, vulnerable and engaged with our, our times. Um, and we know there's lots of people suffering around the world at this time um, who are oppressed um, because of um, skin color or, or class or religious faith and so on. Um, and there's many species that are going extinct, a lot, lots of suffering in various habitats. Um, so I'm just, just, I guess I'm letting everybody know that I know that too, and that this is a context for our work and for this webinar today. Um, and it's probably the, safe to say, or safe to guess that most everybody who's listening here um, is not suffering as much in the ways that there are uh, so many people around the world are. Um, those of us who have um, the kind of privilege we have to tune into a webinar like this or the kind of advantages, um, we're fortunate, of course, and I imagine most everybody would agree with me that that also gives us a um, opportunity to um, make a difference in our world today, and some would say an obligation. And that's really um, the, the framework of, of the work. So, okay, so the focus today is on um, what I call a journey of soul initiation. That is the title of, of my new book. Um, and let's start with a basic definition. Um, the journey of soul initiation is a process that's found in any healthy culture. It's a, it's a multi-year process. It's a, it, it, it takes some years to, to go through. Uh, I've seen it as fast as about one year, but usually it's several years for most people. And it results in, um, here's three things it results in. First is the deepest personal rootedness in the more than human world, an experience not just an experience, but an actual deep rootedness or connectedness with the larger earth community. That's something most of us really long for. The second thing that a journey of soul initiation results in is the greatest and deepest experience of personal meaning and purpose, uh, which is, and this is a big crisis that uh, most everybody we know, so many people we know are, is suffering, are suffering. This, uh, this longing for a, a deeper sense of meaning and purpose. That's one of the results, the second one of the journey. And the third is our most valuable and fulfilling contribution to life and actually to the enhancement of life. Something again that, that we all long for. Um, so the, the journey of soul initiation just is, um, Here's some of the difficulties or challenges here is that the journey is 
is not um, available to most people in the contemporary world because it takes place during a stage of life that I've come to believe uh, most contemporary humans, especially in industrialized uh, cultures, uh, never reach. Um, and this is a, a difficult thing to say, and it's a, a difficult thing to hear. Um, and I'll be getting into more about what that entails. Um, but let me say again, the, the journey um, is of soul initiation. We find it in uh, the records of healthy cultures of the past and uh, contemporary healthy cultures. Unfortunately, there's not too many left because of industrialized dominator cultures like our own. And I believe any healthy culture of the future will re-envision and reclaim and find new ways to um, facilitate the journey of soul initiation. Um, and that's what we've been doing at Animus Valley Institute for 40 years. We've been, first of all, mapping the deep structure of the journey so that we're trying to get as close as we can to being able to say, this is the basic underlying structure that you'd expect of the journey of soul initiation in any culture. And then in some ways, more importantly, is we're creating our own version of a contemporary nature-based uh, approach to the journey. Um, so maybe I've already implied it, but let me say it directly that um, I believe the journey of soul initiation has been forgotten or lost in most contemporary societies around the world now. And it's so far off the map, for example, of the Western world that it's a little bit hard at first to understand what it is. Uh, the way our human mind works is that when we hear a presentation from somebody about something, we, our mind just immediately starts trying to categorize it. Oh, this must be a version of that or thing or that sort of thing. So um, maybe I'll tell you now um, some of the things it isn't. Um, but first I have to back up and say that this new book, although it's called The Journey of Soul Initiation, and it is, that's what it is about. It's primarily, the book is focused on one particular uh, spiritual adventure that happens at least once during the journey of soul initiation. And that's what I call the descent to soul. Um, and it can happen more than once during the journey. And it can happen one or more times after it. Okay, so, um, I, I'm not sure if I should say, I hope I don't burst any bubbles here or that I hope I do. It's probably really both. Um, but the first thing is the, the descent to soul is not a rite of passage. Rites of passage are fantastic. Uh, um, they, the fact that we have in the Western world been uh, rediscovering rites of passage and finding new ways to implement them for various kinds of passages is a huge boon for the Western world. But the descent to soul is absolutely not a rite of passage. Sorry about that. Second thing, it's not a process of healing or therapy. I've been a psychotherapist, or at least used to be for decades, and I'm a big believer in healing and therapy of all kinds, but the descent to soul is not therapeutic. It's actually counter therapeutic. It will wreck whatever life you're living at the beginning of it. Third thing, it's not a hero's journey in the way that Joseph Campbell spoke about it. Um, my book goes into some detail about why it isn't, but that might be um, a surprise to some. It's also not a vision fast, although um, the descent to soul is often can be facilitated by a vision fast, but lots and lots of other things can happen during vision fasts. And um, the book has plenty of examples of people who have gone through soul initiation who never um, enacted anything like a vision fast. It's also not a psychedelic trip or an entheogenic journey, although that can be part of a descent. It's not what Jungian analysts do. Sorry. Again, the book goes into some detail. It is not shamanism and it's not neo-shamanism. It's not a dark night of the soul. That's a very different thing. It's not a union with the divine, nor an experience of non-duality, as deeply transforming as those experiences are. This is something really different. Um, and last, it's not a way to discover your social or vocational purpose. Sorry. Um, 
the descent to soil and the journey of soil initiation more generally allows us to discover the place we were born to take in the larger earth community. So it, you could say it's actually ecological. It's our ecological place. Um, sometimes we refer to, it shows us our mythopoetic identity. It, it helps us understand ourselves metaphorically. I'll give you some examples as we go along. Um, okay, so before I get into details about the descent to soul, um, I need to back up here a bit with you, um, like back out into space, looking down at our globe, as Edgar Mitchell did, and um, and look at the big picture here. Um, and so I need to say something that might sound radical and outrageous, um, but I'm, and others of you will say, yeah, well, duh, obvious. But um, at the very least, I wanted to encourage you to, to give this some consideration. Uh, when I look at the crises in the world today, um, the environmental crises, uh, the social crises, the political crises, and on and on, and the pandemic, of course, and um, what I've ended up, like, like most people, I've asked myself, what, why? Why are things this bad uh, and dire? Um, and I've ended up coming to a conclusion that the, the root problem is arrested human development. And it's widespread. Um, it's it's a, a problem in virtually all contemporary cultures other than the, the healthy nature-based ones that still are intact, which again, apparently there aren't too many left. Um, so so I, I want to invite you to consider that possibility that in a certain way, most people don't fully grow up anymore. Um, and my informal statistic is that 80 to 90% of Western people um, never get beyond what I consider early adolescence. So I'm not talking about our teen years, but a psychological stage that starts at puberty. And for most people, they might, no matter how old they get, they die out of um, a version of early adolescence. Um, so, and I believe we can trace every major crisis in the world today to that fact. That another way to say this is that the, the kind of behavior we see in the world today, every day, in the news and on our neighborhoods and so forth, is not the way mature humans act. Um, murdering each other, um, polluting, um, lives that are addicted to substances or other kinds of addictions, uh, lives of, um, what did Thoreau call them, lives of, um, of um, desperation, it's not quite the quote, but something like that. Um, and I believe that uh, this situation of arrested human development is actually for most contemporary societies, thousands of years old. Now consider that possibility. If that's true, if it's true that like Western society, for example, lost we lost our initiation practices and ceremonies, not generic initiation practices, but the one that leads to uh, soul initiated adulthood, then it's so far gone, it's, it's, it's off our maps and it's something we hardly remember anymore. So when, when I say or suggest that um, we don't, that most people don't mature the way we are designed as human beings by evolution to mature, um, I'm talking about a kind of maturation that is completely different than the, the way we use maturation in the Western world. So what do we mean? In the, in the mainstream world, we mean something like a mature person fulfills certain kinds of responsibilities or has developed certain kinds of virtues or um, um, has honed certain kind of skills like nonviolent communication or the capacity for empathy and so on. And that's, those are reasonable ways of talking about maturation. But I believe 
that any in a healthy society, any healthy early adolescent would be mature in all those ways. So when I when I say that um, I believe that there's a lack of maturation, I'm talking about something completely different. And and so here's here's my um, at least one of my definitions of adulthood. A true adult is somebody who experiences their primary membership as being in the more than human world in the larger earth community. That's, that's the way a true adult, that's how they identify their true and deepest belonging. They also have identities in terms of uh, gender or sexual identity and um, maybe religious faith and ethnicity, uh, race, um, organizations you belong to and so forth. And that lends tremendous courage. I mean, color to our life. But an adult is someone whose primary experiences viscerally, their experience uh, of being in the natural, of uh, their place in the natural world as their primary belonging. And second, an adult is someone who's had one or more experiences of the unique place in the earth community. They're, I call it our unique ecological niche. And third, an adult is somebody who has found one or more ways of embodying that unique ecological niche as a gift to their um, people and to the greater world. And I believe that's something that we all long for, even if we don't have or didn't have words or ways of explaining that. Um, so, okay, here's another really difficult thing to have to say, but it's something, a definitive conclusion I've come to. And that is um, not only are we in the contemporary world, are we, is it rare to have true elders, which is a conclusion that quite a few people have come to and written books about. But I believe the, the truth is even more difficult and radical than that. And that is it's relatively, we have relatively few true adults. Um, and the, the real difficult passage is from early adolescence to adulthood, not from adulthood to elderhood. Um, so some of these things I've um, attempted to describe in my second book, which is called Nature and the Human Soul, which presents a um, nature-based uh, map of the stages of human development that I believe we're meant to go through as humans. Uh, it's a, and it's a progression that gets um, uh, suppressed by the, by the contemporary world. Um, okay, so um, look at my notes because so I don't leave too many things out. Uh, oh, it it might you might have got the impression so far that I that I'm painting a really dire picture, and in some ways I am. But to bring in the good news. I believe that it's relatively easy actually to move through the stages, the healthy stages, I call the echocentric or the soul centric stages of development, if you have support to do it, or if you know what kind of um, ways to work on personal development. Um, the kinds of things that help us move through the stages are the kinds of things that the contemporary world tends to suppress or ignore or neglect. But it's not that um, the kinds of practices that help us get there are um, actually relatively easy to, to find. Um, but it helps to have a, a map so that you don't end up leaving out too many pieces. And so the maps that we've developed at Animus Valley Institute are all based on nature's templates. So for example, we use the four cardinal directions, which a lot of indigenous cultures and even our own Western in indigeneity, if we go far enough back, used the four directions or the four seasons of the year, or the four times of day. These are three of the natural maps that we have. And I don't believe we, we could have come to the clarity that we have come to without that. Okay, so what I wanna do now is, um, now that I've said all the things that the descent to soul is not, I wanna say what it is. And um, so, at Animus, we use two um, frameworks or analogies 
to help people understand this spiritual adventure that usually lasts a year or more. Um, and I call it Descent to Soul, which again is this, it's the core piece of the journey of soul initiation. And we've um, mapped it with five phases. And one of the analogies is what I call Soul Canyon. And um, this is probably would be a good time to put that um, image up on the screen for people. So you see in this image, um, it starts on the left and goes to the right. Um, it's like you're walking along a um, table or mesa or highland there that's, that's labeled preparation. And that's the first phase. And the second phase is, is actually the fall into the canyon. And I've labeled that here, we call it dissolution. And the third phase, which is being in the bottom of the canyon is soul encounter. I'll explain all of these in a moment. And the fourth phase is when we're climbing back out the other side of the canyon, that's called metamorphosis. And the fifth phase, once we get back up to the top and, uh, and are on our way back to the village, so to speak, is enactment. Um, but let me say that one of the other analogies we use is what a caterpillar goes through when it's um, in the cocoon or the chrysalis. And it also goes through five phases. And the preparation, let's do that one first. The preparation is essentially the time that the caterpillar is uh, creating, it's weaving its cocoon if it's a moth or it's turning its body miraculously into a chrysalis, which is essentially like a cocoon if it's a butterfly a caterpillar. And dissolution is the second phase for the caterpillar transformation. And it's when the caterpillar, caterpillar's body actually dissolves into soup. And there's, there's nothing, there's almost nothing left of the original caterpillar structure. But there were these cells in the caterpillar's body all along, probably unbeknownst to it, that biologists call imaginal cells because they're imagining the adult version of this species, which is a moth or a butterfly. And uh, biologists call that adult an imago, I-M-A-G-O. And so that's why they call the cells imaginal cells. These cells know how to take um, the recyclable materials of a former caterpillar body, which is now soup, and refashion it into this completely different creature called a butterfly or a moth. And soul encounter is that moment when the uh, imaginal cells wake up and, and have a glimpse of flight, or that you might say the caterpillar has a glimpse of flight. And the next phase, metamorphosis, is this essential phase where the caterpillar body is actually um, reformed into a butterfly. It's when the butterfly is made during metamorphosis. Um, just having the vision in soul encounter of flight, of being a butterfly or a moth is not enough. If the cocoon opens then, caterpillar soup spills out and goes splat and there's never a flying creature. So metamorphosis takes some time and is essential. And enactment for the butterfly or the moth is something like it's, it's coming out of the cocoon, but it can't fly yet because it has to take some time to pump fluid through its new wings and to uh, flap those wings and to get them ready for flight. And that corresponds to the enactment phase. Um, okay, so for us humans, the preparation phase um, can take some, take a year or more, but there's actually a, like a pre-preparation phase. So I, to remind you of something I said earlier, that the journey of soul initiation and including our first descent to soul doesn't happen until we reach what I consider to be late adolescence, which is the stage that I believe 80% or more of contemporary people never reach because they're not culturally supported to do that. Um, so one, like the pre-preparation is completing our developmental tasks of early adolescence, which I call the oasis. And when we have completed enough of that work, maybe we'll get to later what that, those tasks are, um, then there's not 
some adult or elder that comes along and waves a wand over your head and says, okay, now you're ready for um, late adolescence, which I call the cocoon for obvious reasons, um, but rather mystery. Mystery is what deems that we're ready and, and moves us into the cocoon. And in, the, in that passage, I call confirmation, going from the oasis to the cocoon. And during confirmation, we realize that everything we understood about ourselves, our identity, as true as it might be, is not deeply who we are. And everything we understood about what, how life is and what the world is, was actually wrong. And this, it's a very challenging, you might even say traumatic moment in our life. And that's true when we move from any stage of life to the next ones. Uh, the life we were familiar with is, is now gone. Okay, so, but once we're in the cocoon, um, there's further preparation and it mostly has to do with um, uh, cultivating our innate facets of human wholeness that we have least cultivated up to that point in our life. The, the weakest facets of wholeness, the ones that we need um, before we make that descent. And don't have time at, right now to go into those facets, but they're described in uh, my third book, which is called Wild Mind. But what happens during dissolution? Once we get to the edge of Soul Canyon, we start. We feel like we're just falling uh, into an abyss, and everything we believe about our identity starts to fall away. This this phase is also in some traditions called dismemberment. Um, and so mine, for example, my dissolution and my first descent to soul was at age um, 29 or 30. And I was a professor of psychology and doing fantastic uh, at it and enjoying it. But I did a winter solo climb of a mountain in the, in the um, uh, Adirondacks where I was teaching and working. And at the top of that mountain, uh, I, this overwhelming feeling of grief and hope came up through my belly. And um, I literally fell to my uh, knees in the snow. And I realized that my, my brilliant career as a research psychologist was over because it, it wasn't who I was. And uh, way off in the distance, um, at the bend of a river miles below me, the, the sunlight was gleaming off the waters of the river. And for me, that symbolized where I had to go to. I felt this really deep longing that I had to wander into the world until I found that mysterious thing. Um, and that, that brief story represents two of the patterns that are very common, if not um, universal in the experience of dissolution. We call it the call and the crisis. It's always both. That um, again, this only happens for people who are made it to the cocoon. There's something that's sort of similar happens in early adolescence, but that we call a molting, which is a really different thing. But when this happens, when you're in the cocoon, um, there's this call and that sometimes is Joseph Campbell referred to it as the call to spiritual adventure. Um, and we experience it as um, we might say like the soul, my soul is calling to me and, and telling me to, to, to go out the door of my house and, and not look back and that, that house of belonging is over, um, which is also the crisis aspect. There's, there's some way that our really successful life in, uh, when we're in the cocoon starts to fall apart. That's one of the things to emphasize about the descent to soul. It's not something that happens for people whose lives are miserable and uh, are, are stuck in a really difficult, depressed or anxious or addicted place. That when the descent happens, it's usually for people whose lives are actually doing quite well um, because we need to have reached that capacity before um, we're ready for the descent. Like our life, our life has to be somewhat well formed before it can really fall apart. Okay, so um, when we have fallen far enough apart, we go into this experience of soul incarnate, which is when we get the glimpse of, um, of our unique ecological niche, but we 
don't literally get it like a description of an ecological niche. We um, have a um, symbolic, revelatory, or visionary experience, which metaphorically points towards our unique ecological niche. Um, for those who've read any of my books, you'll know that my first soul encounter was an interaction with a butterfly um, on my first vision fast. And um, given the time, I'm gonna to have to make a very long story short that the butterfly flew past me and actually brushed the left side of my face with her wings. And I heard her say, this is after four days of fasting, I heard her say, cocoon, leave her. And I thought that was pretty interesting, um, but not any more interesting than what was going on in that meadow at 11,500 feet in Northern Colorado, like the pikas who were gathering uh, watercress for winter. Um, but after about a minute, um, this incredibly deep emotion burst up through me and out my mouth. And uh, I realized that I had been just shown or told what my, who I really am and what my life is about. It's, it took me years to discover what that means, cocoon weaver, um, and I'm still learning, as um, I think is the case with our mythopoetic identities. We're always being shaped by it. Which brings us to metamorphosis, um, because that is the reshaping of our egos. And it's essential that we take the time. That's, that can easily take a year or more in the cocoon because what's happening during metamorphosis is our adolescent ego is being shape-shifted into an adult ego. An adolescent ego is basically um, ego-centered in a certain way that feel, the question is, you know, how, it might even be, what is my purpose and how can I serve other people? But it's, the identity is still focused on the ego. Where an adult ego is um, primarily experiences itself it's or, or that their self as a um, agent for the soul. That I'm here to do the soul's work. And it takes some while to, it just, just having a vision doesn't do it. The vision itself is a, um, it's not primarily information. It's not like, oh, great. Thanks, mystery or soul. So, okay, so I'm gonna spend my life weaving cocoons or helping other people weave cocoons. Great, I'll get on it tomorrow. It's not that kind of thing at all. That, um, in fact, some visions aren't any, aren't information at all. They're just, they're somatic and psychic experiences that shift us. And that's the important thing is that the ego is actually shape-shifted. And again, that takes some while for that to happen. That, by the way, is one of the phases that Joseph Campbell's hero's journey uh, doesn't have, but that's only one of the differences. Enactment, to make it really short here, so I wanna um, offer you an experience in a moment, um, but just so briefly, enactment is that phase where, where we begin to do our best to embody our mythopoetic identity in our relationships with other people. And at first, we really don't know how to do it but it's an essential phase that we must go through even before we um, identify what I call a delivery system for our, um, our soul work. A delivery system can be an art or a discipline or a career or even a personal style. <clears throat> okay, so um, Andrea, I think it was just yesterday, you invited me to um, provide a little experience here um, that's somehow relevant to the journey of soul initiation. And my immediate response was to laugh and say, that is ridiculous. The journey of soul initiation has all these components to it and it, it takes you know, at least a few years to go through. What could I possibly do? And I was about ready to totally write it off when the muse, my muse showed up and said, shut up. It's actually, here's, a, here's one you could do that actually would work because this one works for people regardless of whether, of what stage of life they're in. It's something that is under, like an underpinning in a certain way um, of the journey. So it's, um, this will be a brief guided meditation or um, deep 
imagination journey. <clears throat> I'll start speaking a little slower. And um, I want to invite you to get yourselves into a comfortable pos position where you can still hear me. Most people like to close their eyes, but it's not essential. And I want to invite you to notice that you're breathing and that you're not just breathing in generic air, but the truth is you're breathing in the sky and you're not breathing in generic sky, you're breathing in the sky of the particular place you are. And you're probably in, well, you're in a watershed somewhere unless you're on a sh ship in the ocean, but whatever, wherever you are, it's a particular sky and it has the breath of not only other humans, but other animals and the breath of uh, green growing things. <clears throat> and there's all kinds of other things in this sky and you're breathing all these in. And if you'd like, you can imagine that the sky, when you breathe in, is not just filling your lungs, but it's filling your whole body. Just imagine that. Every cell of your body is being nourished by sky. And it's true through our lungs and our um, circulatory system. It's true. Every cell in our body is being nourished, not just by the air, but sky, a particular sky. And I also want to invite you to imagine that your body is something like a seed that's just under the surface of a very rich, fertile soil, like you probably have under you somewhere or not too far from you. And that you're, the seed of your body is sending roots down into the earth, the fertile earth, and seeking out pockets of earth nourishment. And you're drawing, drawing that earth nourishment up through your roots, which as any being with roots, you know how to do that. And the earth nourishment is feeding every cell in your body, which by the way, is totally true, except we normally do it by eating. But that's true that every day, Every cell of our body is being nurtured and fed by the sky and by earth. So inviting you to tune in to that reality that's happening now and all the time. And then I wanna invite you in your imagination to go in your imagination to some wild nature place that you've been sometime in this life or even a place that you have imagined or could imagine now some place that for you is mysterious and enchanted. And it's probably a place where you have felt very, very alive. And you could choose one with your strategic mind or even better, you can just let one pop into your memory now of a place you've been in your body or in your imaginal body. At some wild place that's, that's relatively intact or totally intact, a diverse ecosystem where everything gives away to everything else and everything is what it is by virtue of its relationship to everything else, which is the way it works. And I wanna invite you to feel what it's like to be in this place, the mystery of it, the enchantment of it, what you see in there or who you see and who you hear and what you hear, maybe even what you taste on the wind and your felt sense of this place. And in this place, I want to invite you to feel or sense or hear something like what we might call the call from soul, the call from your depths, or the call from the mystery of this place that's calling to you. And at the same time, I want to invite you to experience your longing, 
the longing you've always had that you were born with and we know you were born with, you know you were born with because you're human, because you're a critter, a being of this earth, that you were born with this longing to encounter, to interact with that which is calling you. And it's, it's as deep and in many ways an erotic longing that you've ever experienced. And, and you've probably experienced it before. I just want to invite you to experience it right now. Both the mystery, the soul calling to you and your longing for the soul. Let that channel be as open it as it is willing and you're willing to allow it to be. And as that channel opens, you might see something or some being might appear to you or you might hear something or you might remember something from the past or the future. I want you to invite you in particular to gather the feeling, the emotion and the body feeling of this longing. And gather it to you. And in your imagination and in your somatic experience, gather up that feeling and place it in a particular place in your body, which you intuitively know is the best place to store this. As if, you know, there's, there's a little bundle and you can store it someplace in your actual body and place it there for safekeeping so that it comes with you. And so that you can access it anytime you want. When you're ready, I'd like to invite you, if you'd like, and if you can, to jot down a few notes when you're ready to open your eyes. And if there's something you want to remember, at the very least, like where you, in your body you stored that longing, or something about who you met or what you experienced in that wild place, or what maybe strands of poetry showed up in the midst of this experience, what memories you had. Just take a couple of minutes. If you, if you have a lot to write, make it shorthand because it's only gonna be about a minute or two at the most. Okay, while you're finishing up taking notes, if you are, here's a kind of follow-up to that little experience. You might want to go to a wild place somewhere the next few days, or a semi-wild place. Could be just a city park. Could be your backyard. Um, and open your heart to this feeling of longing, longing to merge with this mystery of the soul that's now stored in your body in a certain place. And there in that place, 
I want to invite you to fall into that particular love affair with the soul. You might find yourself reciting love poems that you make up or that you have brought with you. You might f find yourself dancing for the beloved of the soul who is calling to you. Um, and the invitation is just let it happen to you. Let yourself be torn open and have, let your heart be stretched in that way. Okay, Andrea, ready for questions or conversation? Wow, well, I just wanna say thank you for that um, guided journey. And I see some people chatting in um, their gratitude for that as well. And for having it, you have a place in our own bodies and then exploring it out in a wild place in the next few days. So I hope everyone does do that. So thank you so much, Bill, for saying yes to the experiential and listening to the whispers of the muse and for your presentation about this journey. So we have plenty of questions um, that have come in. I'm really excited to get your thoughts on some of the questions our participants are asking. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. If you'd like to ask a question to Bill, you can put it in the Q&A box um, and we'll get to as many as possible. Um, so first I'm gonna ask a question from Davy D. And they said, I love your books, first of all. So they're saying, thank you for your, your writing. And then regarding the terminology of soul, can you clarify what this means in the context of this practice? Yes. Thank God somebody asked that, you know, it's. There's so many important things to say in a half hour and uh, invariably I leave out some of the most important ones and that's one of them. So yeah, um, I use the word soul like the word adult and elder and maturation and so on uh, very differently than we do in the Western world. And this one, this has been hard for me because um, you know I was trained as a psychologist and so uh, as a depth psychologist in particular. So I'd look to Carl Jung and James Hillman, for example, uh, about what we mean by the word soul. And after years and years of trying to make it work, I realized, no, that, that doesn't work for me. And finally, I came to this radical conclusion. This is radical conclusion number 75 or something. And that is soul is not primarily and really at all a psychological concept or a spiritual one, not the way I use it. Not, not the way that the, even anybody uses it when we're talking about our deepest meaning or purpose. It's, uh, but rather it's an ecological concept. And I think that's why Western psychology, which is really young, it's only 120 years old, um, has had such trouble with it. Um, even people like James Hillman basically refused to define it. Although I did a major study of Hillman's work 20 years ago or so and found he actually had about six or eight different definitions. He used it in so many different ways. So um, I kind of already implied it, but this is what I mean by soul. A thing's unique ecological niche. Everything is born with exactly what it needs to take a certain unique place in the earth community. Um, Every species has a certain kinds of niche, yes, but every individual of every species has its own unique niche within a species. And as far as we can tell, one thing that's true about us humans is that um, we are more differentiated from each other than is true of most other species. It's very true that every individual human has a unique ecological niche. Uh, mine has to do with weaving cocoons. That's my mythopoetic way of understanding my soul. So if you play with it, you'll realize there's a lot of implications and repercussions of having that kind of an ecological definition of soul. Some people at first say to me, well, Bill, you just basically changed the topic. And I say, no, no, I bet you would agree, end up agreeing with me that I haven't. That if soul in just the most general connotative sense has something to do with things that have, that suggest our deepest meaning or purpose in life, well, what could be deeper than the place we were born to take? Okay, so there. 
Beautiful, I love it. And we, we have some people upvoting questions, which is great. So I'm gonna take a question from, we have a couple, couple questions around the feminine, um, as well as the difference between men and women as they experience um, the soul descent and soul initiation. Um, there's a question from Steph who says, my question will always be about the differences between soul journey experienced by male and female. Um, so much of the spiritual liter literature comes from a male point of view, and I believe it could be different for a woman. Um, and she goes on to say a little bit more, but I wonder if you can just speak to anything that you've noticed of the dis difference or not between men and women going through this descent. Yeah, it's such an important topic that I'll always be learning more about. And um, I believe that um, the deep structure of the journey is the same for people of any gender and any kind of body. Um, the deep structure is the same. Um, but there's some ways of facilitating or navigating the journey of soul initiation that will work better for some people, depending on whether they have a male, um, male or female body. Um, for example, one of my colleagues is developing uh, ways to, um, more than one of my colleagues, ways to um, guide and support the descent to soul that had to do with a woman's blood and her, her, her blood cycle. Um, and it's something that probably wouldn't work for male body people, obviously. Um, and the kinds of um, practices we use at Animus Valley Institute seem to work equally well, as far as we can tell, for male and female bodied people. Um, but there's, so far I can say there's some, these, these special developments, um, ways of guiding the descent for female bodied people. And I don't know that we've really got that for male bodied people, at least at Animus. Um, but this, boy, this is this larger topic of what do we mean by the feminine and what do we mean by the masculine? And that's, you know, one of the radical perspectives that I ended up getting to at 40 years of doing this work. I have a, a very different perspective on it somewhat. That there's, I, uh, before I alluded to the, what we call at Animus, the four facets of human wholeness, which I describe in my book, Wild Mind. And um, I believe that regardless of what kind of gendered body we have, we all have, we're born with the seeds of these four facets of wholeness. Um, but the Western world thinks of two of them as feminine and, and the other two as masculine, where I think that's actually a mistake that, that, we're, that every human is born with uh, equal dimensions of femininity and masculinity. And our Western world does such a, a poor job with it that um, it's one way that early adolescent uh, men in power have protected themselves from their own development because they have uh, protected, they have written off their own femininity, projected it onto women and said, this is not masculine and it's also not good. And it might even be evil and we've got to uh, oppress it in every way we can. And that's one way to dominate our societies, which are often one version of which are patriarchal, um, maintain um, their tragic course. Okay, you could probably tell I could go on for a while about this, um, but maybe we'll move on. Thanks for that question. I love it. Yeah, there's about three or four questions about how the feminine relates to this soul journey. So thank you for expanding on that. Yeah, that's really important. Um, great. So we've got a question here from Susanna. Um, he says, I find myself resisting connecting with the longing because I sense that my grief is an abyss I will never climb out of. I also resist surrendering to the mystery because I fear I will never leave and not be able to make a living or stay physically alive. I invite and welcome any insights. Yeah, beautiful question and courageous question. Um, everybody resists the journey of soul initiation and 
hopefully just a little bit less than we long for it. But the resistance is just totally natural because we're going to lose everything. What did T.S. Eliot say? It's a cost, nothing less than everything to go on this journey of soul initiation. So we naturally resist it. And the parts that resist it is what um, are these parts of our psyche that are well known in Western psychology, except at Animus, we created our own ways of talking about them. We call them the four categories, the four groups of inner protectors. And our inner protectors, which we've had since near birth, are there to keep us safe psychologically and physically and to keep any big change from happening. So um, one of the things they say to us is, if you say yes to this descent, you're going to fall into grief so deep, it'll eat you up and you'll never get out of it and you'll be in grief for the rest of your life. So that's one of the things I heard. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the question questioner, but um, yes, that is totally common. Um, and the truth is that when you go on the descent, one thing that happens for everybody is you fall very deeply into your grief because grief is such a teacher, it's such a heart stretcher. There's so many losses in our personal lives and our global life now and our ancestors' lives and that you can't get through the descent to soul or the larger journey without letting grief happen to you. And it turns out there is no record of every, anyone ever getting stuck there if they allow it to happen. If, they, if you try to back your way out, you can get stuck. But if you go through, you always get through, 100%. Um, and then what was the other one about never leaving? If I say yes to mystery, I'll never leave. Again, that's an inner protector that's saying the cost is too much. And when a person finally does go on the descent, it's because they say to themselves and they mean it. Whatever the cost is, I'm willing to pay it. I don't care if it's everything. And before you can say that to yourself, you're not entirely ready. And, and then you have some great preparation work to do, which is a good thing to do. Amazing. Yes, another one here from Victoria says, my question is about daily practices you suggest and perhaps also you do yourself to progress toward or along this journey. Daily practices. Okay, so I'm going to start with one of the most annoying things I say, and especially because I, I keep repeating it, and it's just because it makes all the difference in the world. And that is this, um, the practices in this case depend on what stage of life you're in. Um, if you're in um, early adolescence, there's a very different set of practices than if you're in late adolescence, the, co the cocoon. Um, what can I do to give you a shorthand answer? Um, again, my book, Wild Mind, will um, is just chock full of practices, especially for people in the oasis, which is early adolescence. And by the way, there's actually two kinds of early adolescence. There's what we call egocentric and echocentric. And probably at least 50% at least of the people in the Western world are not only stuck in early adolescence, but they're in an egocentric adolescence, which uh, is characterized by um, a, a lot of personal challenges, social challenges, often addictions, uh, violence, uh, prone to violence, um, um, and so on. I mean, just um, really, I call it pathoadolescence. Um, and one version of that I call conforming and rebelling. There's a lot of people in the world who are doing their best to conform to one peer group and to rebel against other groups or political groups or religious groups or racial groups. And this is a severe pathology that has overtaken much of our contemporary societies. But a lot of people are in a healthy early adolescence, the oasis, which is a great stage to be in. There's no such thing as a bad stage to be in except the egocentric versions um, of the first three stages. So, okay, practices, daily practices. Um, one of the best, um, and this is a great one, whether this is a practice that helps you towards the journey of soul initiation or 
through it, if you're in the cocoon, is a practice that my uh, life partner and guiding partner, Janine Marie Haugen, often recommends. I think she did just this morning in a musing, one of our um, Animus Valley musings that she's been writing for many months now. Um, it's praise. It's to go out onto the land as a daily practice and to praise the wild world and to do it out loud um, and to praise it as beautifully and as poetically as you can. You know, look around, open your heart and imagine, if you're not already convinced of it, imagine that every single thing, every growing thing, every animal, every rock, every cloud, et cetera, every mountain, every river, every stream is an animate living thing. And many of us, the people who are on this webinar, you already know that, you already have the experience. If you don't, pretend, pretend that it is. And watch as your heart opens to these other beings and ask yourself, what is, what are you astonished by, surprised by? What makes you wonder? What's your, where's your curiosity? And then praise that being out loud. Um, especially if there's someone who could overhear you and might think you're a little crazy, but most people start out doing this by going to a place where no one would hear them or read love poems to places or sketch things. Um, so in other words, the love affair with the world, the, the world that our contemporary culture has done everything it can to separate us from, everybody knows that. Um, but we need more than an intellectual understanding that we're, that, that we're a kin or kith of everything. We need the embodied experience. Um, so turn off your devices, daily practice, go outside. Um, and don't just look and don't try to categorize with Latin terms, but or classify. Um, but open your heart to that being and speak to it, that animate being. And um, okay, so that's one of dozens of practices, but maybe one of the best ones. And you'll find many, many, many more in actually any of my books. Amazing, thank you for that, for that practice. Um, and our next top voted question is from Renee, who's asking, how often do people who experience the disillusion stage attempt suicide? And there's also another question about, can you lose everything and still, still be deeply connected? So I'd love your thoughts. Lose everything and still be deeply connected to. Oh, you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll don't try. Um, yeah, I'm so glad, Renee, you asked that question about suicide because it's real. Um, it doesn't come up very often in our animus programs, but it does come up at, at times. And this underlines the importance of preparation. Um, it also underlines being sure you're in the cocoon and not in, in the oasis. Because one thing that happens that's necessary in the cocoon at certain times is to, is to separate ourselves from our social community. You don't ever wanna do that in any significant way, except maybe on a spiritual retreat during the oasis. That, that uh, psychological health in early adolescence is founded upon our social connections. And when people are socially isolated and in the early, early adolescence, often an egocentric version, it's uh, devastating and often leads to suicide. I mean, that's the last thing you wanna do. Um, it's not therapeutic to be socially isolated, but at certain points for people in the cocoon, it's necessary. That's one way, reason I say that the descent to soul is not therapeutic. In some ways, it's counter therapeutic. Okay, but even if you're in the cocoon and it, it's actually a dissolution and not some early adolescent experience, it's something like it. Again, we call it molting. Molting comes from when caterpillars shed their skin and grow bigger ones. They're adolescents, they're caterpillars on both sides. They're just bigger caterpillars with new skin after a molting. And people often confuse the human version of molting with the descent to soul. They're very, very, very different things. Um, I go into great detail in the book about that. It's a very important distinction. But all that said, 
Rene, um, if you're really in the cocoon and you're really on a descent and you're really going through dissolution and you haven't prepared as well as you can be and you start feeling suicidal, you need to get some help. Ideally, you would get a help from a, a soul initiation guide because um, they know they will know what's going on for you. The vast majority, way over 90% of Western psychotherapists would not understand what's going on by what we at Animus mean, the descent to soul. Um, but if any, most any psychotherapist would recognize, of course, what to do if, if you are feeling suicidal. So if that begins to happen during dissolution, you want to press the pause button on your descent the best you can. Sometimes it's hard to do, but you do definitely want to get some help. Go back to the preparation phase. And you probably need to do what we call cultivating one or more facets of wholeness more completely or engage in what we call self-healing, or if you can't, to um, have a healer help you. And sometimes at Animus, we um, have participants who are in that position and we say, okay, we're gonna slow down here, that you're much better to be prepared. So let's work on that first. And then the other part of the question, lose everything and still be connected. Well, again, you heard me ask connected to what? Um, connected to your social community. Um, in the contemporary Western world, you know, we, we're not taken away from the village by the elders and put into an initiation camp for two months or four months or two years or something like that. Um, if we were, we'd have that our new social connection would be our the elders and the, initi the adult initiators and our fellow initiates. Um, having a community to support you and or one or more guides to support you makes all the difference on the descent. If you're doing it alone, it's, it's more challenging. Um, I'll just briefly note that Carl Jung did it alone. He did not have a guide, but he had a, um, a mistress Tony Wolf, who hadn't been through the journey himself, but supported him socially. And he had a wife, Emma, who also supported him. He had five kids and he had colleagues and so forth. Um, and he actually found a way to get through the descent without completely losing his mind. Um, and all of us are beneficiaries of that journey, which was unguided. But he, he, he could have... Um, ended up a suicide. Absolutely. Well, this conversation is just so rich and we're getting so many comments and questions. So thank you everyone for participating. And I can hardly believe that we're just about at our time together. I could just keep, keep deepening into this. And luckily there's um, your new book, The Journey of Soul Initiation, as well as your, I guess, three other books, right? We'll we'll yeah. put all of those in the follow-up email so people Great. can deepen into that, as well as um, information with Animus Valley Institute, where they have a whole group of guides. So we do hope that you'll continue this journey and exploration. And I just want to pass it off to you for any closing comments that you have, Bill, for all our right. speakers today. I guess the, um, the one thing that comes to mind is, and maybe I mentioned a, a version of this earlier, is that as much as our contemporary culture has uh, suppressed and neglected this essential dimension of, of development, it really isn't as hard as you might guess to, to go through these stages and these phases. And one of the reasons is it's how our psyches are designed. It's like, you know, a caterpillar doesn't have to figure out how to become a butterfly. It's already designed to go through that process. I mean, think about that. And uh, butterflies don't have to go to triple A to get a map of how to get from Canada to Mexico. Even though it takes five generations, something like that, of butterflies to make that journey, they're born with that knowledge. Now think about that for a moment. There's not a likelihood that we humans have to be, happen to be a um, exception to that rule. We are born with the knowledge of who you are meant to be in this lifetime. It's in us already. 
in the the psychic, intrapsychic, and interpersonal uh, structures that we need to go through this journey. There, it's it's right there. It's it's built in. That's why people like Carl Jung and so many others can go through this experience without having any idea what's going on, and they still get through it because the design is already in us. It's just that the journey is likely to go somewhat more efficiently and successfully if you have guidance. Okay, so that's a little bit, oh, I'll, I'll actually add one other thing and it's about hope. If it's true that each one of us was born, was, was birthed by the mystery, by earth, to take a certain unique ecological niche in the world, then guess what? Where hope comes from is our soul. That, that we can have hope, not because we're just predicting things might, we might be predicting things will come out well, but because we ourselves are the medicine the world needs if we only go through the initiation journey to be able to embody it. Okay, thank you. <laughs>